Hi there, this is Scholar Minor, a podcast about myth, magic, and occasional miscellany. My name is Ursula, I'm your host and fellow learning enthusiast. In her 2016 collection of essays titled Upstream, poet Mary Oliver writes, I am one of those who has no trouble imagining the sentient lives of trees, of their leaves in some fashion communicating, or of the massy trunks and heavy branches knowing it is I who have come, as I always come each morning to walk beneath them, glad to be alive and glad to be there. This week, we'll be talking about trees. These important and oft-overlooked neighbors not only benefit us on a physical level, but on an emotional one, too. This has been a traumatic year for all of us, and there are still uncertain days ahead. But trees have always been and always will be, and there is some comfort in that. This resilience in trees was also noted by generations past, who regularly incorporated them into folklore, mythology, and superstition. In times of emotional strife, regardless of the century you live in, spending time in the natural world has always been one of the best and cheapest ways we have to ground and center. While there are hundreds to choose from, we'll be discussing three types of trees tonight, the ash, the hawthorn, and the oak. The first of our trees, the ash tree, grows all over the Northern Hemisphere, including the US and Canada, where it's used to construct everything from furniture to baseball bats. It's usually a small to medium-sized tree, though some species can grow up to 120 feet tall. This deciduous tree can be recognized by its compound leaves, the diamond-shaped pattern on the bark of mature trees, and the small winged fruits that hang in clusters until the cold season comes. Yggdrasil, the world tree of Norse mythology, is the most well-known of the ash trees. Growing forth from the void known as Ganunga Gap, it is the framework which encompasses the nine worlds. This includes our world, Midgard, and the others, Asgard, realm of the Aesir, Alfheim, realm of the elves, Hel, realm of those who have died of natural causes such as old age or illness, Jotunheim, realm of the giants, Muspelheim, realm of fire, Svartalfheim, realm of the dwarves, Niflheim, realm of ice, and Vanaheim, realm of the Vanir. At the base of Yggdrasil is a well, the Well of Erd. Guarding this well are the three Norns, Verdandi, present, Erd, the past, and Skuld, the future, who weave the fate of the cosmos and water the world ash tree. Though this is definitely Ash's most prestigious mention tonight, it is represented in folklore all over Europe. In Greece, Ash makes an appearance as the Spear of Achilles and is occasionally associated with the goddess Nemesis and with Cupid. Roman philosopher and naturalist Pliny the Elder championed the ability of Ash to repel serpents and recommended travelers surround their camps with ash leaves. Word of the ash's anti-snake properties traveled to Northern Europe and the British Isles with the Romans, and in Cornwall, ash twigs were sometimes kept with infants in their cribs to prevent serpent attack. In Germany, sap from the ash tree was said to be a snake bite remedy. In an 1856 book titled The British, Roman, and Saxon Antiquities and Folklore of Worcestershire, Author Habetz Ali's leaves us only with the enigmatic observation that in Northern England, Ashwood's anti-witching properties are there held in great esteem. Sounds a bit sinister, but unfortunately Mr. Ali's doesn't give us any details. Ash did have its fair share of magical associates, however. Sudden noises, knocking sounds, or foliage that swayed in the absence of wind was blamed on fairies in the Isle of Man. In the spirit of the recent holiday, it's important to point out that the traditional Yule log burned in fireplaces at Christmas time was originally a log of ash wood, large enough that it would burn for all 12 days of Christmas. According to Richard Folkard, writing in 1884, this was because the infant Jesus was first washed and dressed by a fire of ash wood. 
After the chill of winter has passed and your ashwood yule log has long burnt out, springtime comes full of vim and vigor with the English tradition of May Day. The festivities of the first day of May herald the return of spring and have their roots in pagan seasonal celebrations. There's dancing around the maypole, the crowning of a May queen and May king, weaving garlands of flowers and branches, and an important ingredient in any May Day party is our next tree, the hawthorn. Hawthorn trees can grow to a height of 50 feet and are recognizable by their thorny twigs and their berries. It is deciduous and its leaves are toothed and lobed. Hawthorn flowers are very fragrant and usually white, blooming in large clusters. They are common in Europe and North America. In observance of May Day and the coming of spring, Hawthorn branches were used to decorate homes in an effort to ward off evil influences in the coming year. This gave rise to an Old English custom wherein the first person to bring a bough of hawthorn blossoms into the home on May Day received cream for breakfast. Young ladies took advantage of the magic in the air, following the direction of a charm recorded in 1903's Encyclopedia of Superstitions. The fair maid who on the first of May goes to the fields at break of day and washes in the dew of the hawthorn tree will ever after handsome be. In addition to retaining your beauty and banishing evil, hawthorn was believed to possess incredible healing powers. Of one such healing hawthorn located beside a well, John Rhys quotes A.W. Moore's 1891 The Folklore of the Isle of Man. The patients who came to it took a mouthful of water, retaining it in their mouths till they had twice walked around the well. They then took a piece of cloth from a garment they had worn, wetted it with water from the well, and hung it on the hawthorn tree which grew there. When the cloth had rotted away, the cure was supposed to be effected. The author describes approaching the tree and finding it covered in knotted strips of fabric in various stages of decay. Village herbalists would create a decoction from the hawthorn haw, or fruit, to draw out splinters and thorns. Hawthorne's ability to cure ailments was championed as recently as 1904, when physicians still utilized all parts of the plant, bark, leaves, and fruit, and believed it was an effective tonic for cardiac ailments. Our final tree of the evening is the oak. Here in California, oaks of all shapes and sizes abound. Acorns played an important role in the lives of indigenous peoples in California, including the Nisanan, Ohlone, Maidu, and many others. There are tons of species, and they are common all over the Northern Hemisphere. Oaks can grow to be quite large, up to 100 feet tall and with canopies up to 135 feet wide. Oak is used frequently for constructing cabinetry and furniture, as anyone with a bookshelf purchased in the 90s remembers. Most oak trees are deciduous, with a few exceptions, and their fruit take the form of acorns. If you aren't familiar with oak trees, you can recognize them by their lobed leaves, acorns, oak galls, and on mature trees, deeply fissured bark. Oak galls, also known as oak apples, are spherical growths that commonly develop on oak trees as a result of a certain kind of wasp laying her eggs in a developing leaf bud. Oak galls were used to make writing ink for hundreds of years and have their very own superstitions attached to them. Folkard writes that rural villages had a kind of prediction that if the oak apple, broken, be full of worms, it is a sign of a pestilent year. Okay, so who found the oak apple in 2020 and didn't warn us? Oak trees themselves evidently make a cozy home for our otherworldly friends, including the dryads and the hamadryads of Greek mythology. These beautiful feminine spirits protected the forest and lived within the oak trees, dying only when their tree did. In Germany, oak trees were inhabited by small elves who enjoyed dancing in circles around them and hiding in their boughs. The druids, who were priests, judges, and intellectuals in ancient Celtic society, performed sacred rites in oak groves. In fact, their name comes from a Celtic word meaning knower of the oak tree. Oaks are one of the favorite hosts of mistletoe, a Christmas time favorite, which is actually a parasitic plant that was utilized in many druidic rituals. 
In some lore, the lives of local leaders, especially kings, were often tied to specific oak trees. If harm befell the tree, it means bad news for its human counterpart. It appears that this sympathetic magical connection could also be extended to entire municipalities. In the town of Carmarth in South Wales stood an oak tree known as Merlin's Oak or the Old Oak. This tree was believed to have been associated with none other than the wizard Merlin of Arthurian legend, and it was said that if the oak was removed or destroyed, a great disaster would befall Carmarthen. Though the tree died in 1856, the stump and what remained of it was cemented upright in an effort to prevent harm from coming to Carmarthen. It was eventually removed and nothing disastrous happened, though the town had planted a replacement oak in its stead just in case. An English tradition known as cross oaks dictated that those with illnesses would peg a lock of their hair into oak trees standing at a crossroads, thereby transferring their ailment to the tree instead. The oak tree is frequently associated with magical activity, and motifs featuring the oak appear in pre-Christian Germanic, Slavic, Celtic, and Mediterranean cultures. While this is by no means an exhaustive account of the tales surrounding our new tree friends, the ash, oak, and hawthorn, I hope that you learned something new. Take a look around your neighborhood and see if any are nearby, and if you find one, make a mental note. They're pretty useful to have around. Thanks for joining me, stay safe, be healthy, and I'll talk to you again very, very soon.